Let's think about the following. If we look at the world, we see that there are rich countries and there are poor countries. Within each country, there are communities that are well off, communities that are poor. The question is why? Of course, there could be very many reasons for this, but there's one reason that matters more than perhaps any other, and that is culture. Culture can be very widely defined. It's the way that people think, their habits, the way they enjoy life, the way in which they relate to the other gender, and so forth. Now, this is something that was investigated by a German sociologist, Max Weber, something like 100 or 125 years ago. He wrote a book. It was called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. That book was based upon very extensive research. And what Weber tried to do was to understand why it is that two groups of Christians, Protestants on the one hand, Catholics on the other, both living in Germany and in Europe in general, were very different in terms of their achievements. The Protestants did very well. And in fact, they were the people who went and founded America. On the other hand, the Catholics, well, didn't do too well. Now, since that time, there have been a lot of books and a lot of research done on this subject. I have some of them before me over here. There's a bunch over here. And there are other investigations of how society has been affected by culture. I cannot say that I agree with everything that there is in the books, but certain things do make a lot of sense to me and I'd like to discuss these with you. In this book, Culture Matters, for example, there's something that's defined as cultural capital. Now, normally, capital is that thing, is that financial capital which, when invested, leads to more money following an investment. But here, culture is related to how fast a society progresses, how well it does. And cultural capital can be traced to a number of factors. Let me tell you what I think those factors are. First of all, the attitude, the cultural attitude that you as an individual can change your own life. Lots of people think that they were born poor, that they will be poor, that their children will be poor, and that it is all set from above. In such a situation, you have low cultural capital. On the other hand, if you have a society where people believe that they can actually change them, themselves, they can change their circumstances, that's where there is high cultural capital. Related to that is the idea that wealth is expandable. Now, in the old days, it was thought that wealth is something that's associated with how much land you have, cattle, gold and silver, that it's something finite. You can maybe expand it a little bit, but you can't do too much more than that. And wealth is acquired through conquest primarily by taking it away from somebody else. It's not something that you actually create by your own self. That's not the way that a modern society looks at wealth because wealth is something that is a product of the human mind as much as other things. Well, let me give you an example. The computer, it just didn't exist something like 60, 70 years ago, but now it is fundamental and there are countries that make billions of dollars, not just every year, but every month in the production of this kind of wealth, which only requires the exercise of the brain. And together with this concept of wealth as expandable is the notion that human intellect is the driving force, that knowledge is something that's expandable. It's not static, it's not fixed, it's not given to you only in the books. And now that's very important because the traditional concept of knowledge was that it comes from up there. It's given to you once and for all. On the other hand, here we see that new disciplines of science 
and even of the humanity spring up by the year or perhaps by the decade. Together with this is the concept of education. The old concept was that you had to learn what was there, given in the books. The, the teacher would take a rod and he'd make sure that you learn it. The modern concept of education is totally different. It's something that's internalized. It's something that's used for solving problems with. I've put before you so far three attributes of high cultural capital. First, that there is a belief in free will as opposed to predestination. Second, that wealth is something that's expandable. You can make more through exercise of hard work and reason. And third, that knowledge is also expandable. It's not static, it's not fixed, it's something that's internalized. Now let me come to the fourth attribute of a society that has high cultural capital. And this is trust. There's a scholar at Harvard by the name of Francis Fukuyama, who's actually coined a word called trust capital. The greater the amount of trust that individuals have on other individuals of that society, the more likely it is that you will need less policing. And let's see how this all works. For example, if I trust you and I loan you money and you return it to me, then I'm more inclined to loan it to you again. Or, on the other hand, let's say that you totally distrust me. In which case, if I give you a thousand rupee note, you're quite likely not to accept it because you say, I can't trust you. And so, in such a situation, you would not have commerce. It would be very hard to have any kind of trading if people don't trust. That was the fourth attribute. There's a fifth attribute, and that is respect for law. Humans, if they did not have laws, would be like animals in a jungle. And in the complexity of modern society, the absence of rule of law means that that society would not be able to function. Let's assume, for example, that traffic laws are don't exist or are broken very, very frequently, in which case people will drive on this side of the road or that side of the road, they'll drive every which way. And so in that case, you would not be able to have an orderly traffic system. You would not be able to have goods and services taken from one point to another. You would not be able to transport yourself safely either. If people don't pay taxes, there'll be no money for the central treasury, which means that you will not have roads or bridges or means of communication or hospitals and so forth. And so the rule of law is essential for a society to work together. And societies that have more rule of law, which respect the law to a greater extent, have higher cultural capital. It hardly needs to be said that the wealth in a society is produced by individuals and those individuals, when they work, they produce wealth and the more they work, the better they work, the wealthier they will become, but not just they alone, their community, their society, their country. So obviously, how well people work is very, very important. As we look around the world, we see that some communities, some countries are very hardworking. You look at the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Americans and the Europeans. They're all very hard workers. But let's say if you look at, um, at the Arabs, they don't work. They have plenty of oil. They don't need to work. Weber had actually pointed out that the Protestants were imbued with the with the sense, with the desire that they must work. He called this the work ethic. So a country or a society that has high cultural capital will also have a strong work ethic. My seventh and last point, a society that treats its women on par with the men has high cultural capital. And on the other hand, a society that suppresses its women 
does not allow them to work, gives them lesser rights, has low cultural capital. That's almost obvious. If your women are not allowed to work, that's 50% of your workforce already gone. They cannot participate in any productive, creative process. All that they are required to do is to produce children. And so those are societies that will always remain static. Or they might be pulled up by other societies, but even so, they will remain far, far behind. But actually, it's even worse than that. Because if women are deemed to be inferior to men, then they're likely to be treated in ways that are simply not acceptable in a modern society. You have very frequently women being killed, wives being killed by their husbands, or daughters being killed by their brothers or their fathers, and so forth. Well, properly speaking, such societies don't belong to the modern age. They would be perhaps normal for medieval times or for the Stone Age. Of course, society is changing everywhere, and culture is changing everywhere. The way that we live today is very different from the way that our fathers and our grandfathers lived. And so, although culture is a major determinant in how well a society does, yet it's not something static and fixed. It's something that you and I can change. Through human effort, through volition, through struggle, culture can be made to change. And so, there lies the hope.